Dear friends in Christ, happy Sunday to you all. I welcome you to today's episode of Sunday Reflections with Father Evaristus Egemeyo Abu. Today is the 14th Sunday in Ordinary Time, Year B, and the theme or the topic of today's reflection is What Happens When We Doubt God's Power? Last Sunday, we learned that fear, that is negativity, is one obstacle preventing us from receiving faith's benefits. Jairus had come to call Jesus to save his little daughter. But before Jesus got to the house, some people brought news that the girl was dead. Jesus said to Jairus, Do not fear, only believe. Why fear expects the worst to happen? Faith expects the best. A woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage received healing the moment she touched Jesus' garment because she was so full of expectation. Jesus said to her, Your faith has made you well. Today, our readings continue to teach us about faith. This time, our readings demonstrate what becomes of us when we doubt God. While Jairus and the woman went home celebrating, the people who grew up with Jesus, the people who saw him grow, did not have much to celebrate. Could this be the reason why Jesus drove away those wailing loudly at Jairus' home last Sunday? Miracles are scarce today. Not because Jesus is no longer powerful, but because of obstacles to faith, such as hostility towards God, familiarity with God, falsehood, and pride. Let us now examine these points in details. 1. Miracles are scarce when we are hostile towards God. Jesus came to his own country with his disciples. Unfortunately, as Jesus ministered to them, they began to question his credibility, his family background, and the fact that they knew him only as a carpenter. Mark tells us that they took offense at Jesus. They were angry with Jesus because all they could see was a carpenter who claimed to be God. They could not see God who was out of love for us come to take our human flesh. Lack of faith makes us hostile towards God. We shut the door against God, preventing us from assessing his blessings. Jesus could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. As the saying goes, you may force a horse to the river, but you cannot force it to drink water. God who created us with free will never forces his way on us. Once upon a time, Jesus sent messengers ahead of him to a Samaritan village to prepare for him. But the villagers rejected Jesus. They would not even let Jesus pass through their village. James and John were angry. And they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? Jesus turned and rebuked James and John. And they went on to another village. Luke chapter 9 verse 52 to 56. It's not the case that God is not powerful to allow miracles happen in our lives despite our doubt. No, it is the case that God will allow us. If you say you don't want God, God will not force himself on you. God will allow you. Just as the prodigal son, when he told his father that he wanted to leave the house, the father did not force him to stay. The father only persuaded him, just as God is persuading us to believe in him. But when the son insisted on going, the father allowed him to go. And when he went... He discovered that he had left grace. He had left the place where he would receive the blessings of his father, 
where he would receive the food of his father, the protection of his father, and where he would enjoy the benefits of being under his father's protection. He went to a place where he was abused. His father remained powerful. His father remained rich. His father's you know, wealth did not diminish because he was in a far place, because he was in a distant country where he could no longer enjoy the blessings from his father. So also, God is not powerless when miracles don't happen. Rather, we are the ones who have positioned ourselves in a place where we can no longer assess the miracles that comes with faith. The book of Hebrews tells us that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Why is it that God does not force his way on us? He considers us as his children, not merely as his slaves. If there is one word to describe God's relationship with mankind, it would be love. And as St. Paul would say, love is patient, love is kind, love is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 to 5. 2. Miracles are scarce when we fail to see God in the person of the minister. What made the people hostile to Jesus? Was it that they did not recognize the superior wisdom? No, their hostility was the result of their familiarity with Jesus. They took offense at Jesus because they knew him simply as the carpenter's son. They did not recognize his divinity. Unlike Jairus, who fell on his feet in worship before Jesus while asking for his daughter's healing, the people in Jesus' hometown considered Jesus an imposter. As Mark puts it, many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did he get all this from? Where did this man, they even refer to Jesus as a man, they describe him as man, where did this man get all this from like these countrymen of jesus many christians today have become so familiar with their ministers that they fail to see god in them some catholics refer to their priest as that boy that guy some of us have stopped going for confession in the name of how can i be confessing my sins to a man man not Christ. Because when you go for confession, even though you are seeing a man seated there, putting on his stole, ready to listen to you, your eyes of faith should be able to see that it is not a man that you are confessing to. It is Jesus himself that is seated listening to you. Only faith can do this. And it's only if you have faith that you are able to receive the blessings from the sacrament of penance. Today, some of us have lost a sense of the sacred. Some of us are no longer afraid of God because all we can see is just the monstrance. We can no longer see God in the monstrance. We can no longer see God in Holy Communion. So we just receive Holy Communion casually and as if to say we are just receiving ordinary bread. Some, sometimes the, even the way we dress to church does not indicate that we recognize God's presence. It's like we are dressing to church to, let me use the word, to kill them. You know, they said there, there are some people who call themselves slay queen and slay king. And what does it mean to slay? That is to cut somebody's neck. So we dress because we want to go and slay. Not because we want to go and worship God, but because we want people to, you know, people to bend their neck looking at us. So it's like we are going to church to worship ourselves, not to worship God. We are going to church so that people can pay attention to us. We are looking for followers. You know, we are looking for fans. We are looking for people to, uh, be, we, we want people to be attracted to us. And we are not thinking that we are going to meet God because we don't believe. We are no different from the people in Jesus' hometown. Just as some of us find it difficult to go to confession, there are some of our girls who see the priest 
as a single guy, not as Jesus Christ, not as father, not as their father, but as just a guy that is unmarried, that is uh, rich, available, perhaps doesn't know what to do with his money. And so rather than approach the priest seeking prayers or seeking blessings from God, they approach the priest seeking financial assistance. That is all they want. And they are not interested in anything more. It is this sad. Because we can no longer see that God is present in the priest. Just as the people of Jesus' hometown were no longer could not see that God was present with them. And this is the reason why miracles are scarce today. If Jesus could not do any mighty work in his own country because the people looked down on him, what do we expect of our priests today when we look down on them? Some of us do not even genuflect before Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. And this is sad. So many things we do today that we ought not to do. Some people begin to chew gum inside the church. Why some people, even during the Mass and during the homily, you know, they are scrolling through their phones, browsing Facebook and WhatsApp. There is what is called social media addiction today. So that wherever we find ourselves, once we feel, you know, once we feel bored, we bring out our phones and we begin to press our phones. Why should you be bored in the presence of God? When you are supposed to be contemplating God, when you are supposed to be praying to God, when you are supposed to be receiving blessings, you know, you know, outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Remember, uh, I think it was Ezekiel who saw the vision of a river flowing out from the temple. I think it was Isaiah. Yes, Isaiah. Flowing, there was a river flowing out from the temple. That is the river we come to church to drink. And so you should not be bored. If you are just as you cannot be inside the river, you know, swimming inside the river and at the same time pressing your phone, trying to browse Facebook inside the river, you can't do that. So also, when you're in the presence of God, you should not be browsing social media. If you recognize, that is if you recognize that God is present with you. Familiarity is preventing us from receiving the miracles and the graces that ought to be ours. Thirdly, miracles are scarce when the minister seeks to please the people. So the, the fault could be coming from the people, as we have just mentioned, highlighted various ways through which we can be familiar with God. The fault can also be from the minister himself. It's possible that the minister simply wants to entertain the people. And this is a problem. And this is what will prevent miracles from happening in our church today. In our first reading today, God told Ezekiel, I send you to the sons of Israel, to a nation of rebels. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this day. The people are also imprudent and stubborn. When they hear or refuse to hear, they will know a prophet has been among them. Ezekiel chapter 2 verse 3 to 5. In other words, Ezekiel's obedience to his call matters, not the people's reception. That is what is most important is that you go and do the work that God has given to you. You should not be concerned about entertaining the people, trying to make them happy, trying to tell them what they want to hear. This command given by God to Ezekiel should be the motto for every minister. We should be more concerned about proclaiming God's message than filling up uh, the seats in the church. Jesus instructed his disciples similarly when he said, If anyone would not receive you or listen to your words, shake off the dust from your feet as you leave that house or town. Truly I say to you, it shall not be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, than for it shall be it shall be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Matthew chapter 10, verse 14 to 15. As ministers of God, we are called to deliver the message to the people, just as God has given, given it to us. Our concern should not be how to make the people laugh or how to keep the people entertained. Our concern should be 
to tell them the truth. Our desire to please people at all costs has brought about watering down of the gospel, the reduction of moral standards, and the worship of money in the name of God. Where are the John the Baptists of our time? Where are those who can speak the truth and damn the consequences? Number four, miracles are scarce when the minister becomes, you know, proud. Pride, they say, goes before a fall. It is one thing when the people fail to recognize God in the minister. It is a different thing when the minister now sees himself as greater than God, you know, greater than the church, even greater than others. When the minister now believes that he is God, God will humiliate the minister. And this is the reason why miracles are scarce in our church today. In today's second reading, St. Paul gives us a clue to one factor that could be responsible for the scarcity of miracles. The book of Proverbs says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proverbs 16 verse 18. When the minister becomes proud, he forgets that he is simply an instrument in the hand of God and begins to behave like God among men. Jesus' own was different because he was really God amongst men. But for the minister, we are altar Christus. We are like Christ. We are not Jesus himself. And so we cannot assume that we are now Jesus. No, we are only giving flesh. You know, we are, we are incarnating Christ in our world today. But we cannot, we are not replacing Christ. We're not taking his place. We just incarnate him. And all these require faith. St. Paul says to us, he said, to keep me from being too elated, that is, from becoming proud, by the abundance of revelations, a thorn was given me in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to harass me, to keep me from being too elated. Three times I besought the Lord about it, that it should leave me, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I will gladly boast of my weakness, that the power of Christ may rest upon me. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7 to 9. Having learned to rely only on God's grace, St. Paul says, For when I am weak, then I am strong. Watch when the minister begins to boast that he has become greater than God. As the saying goes, empty vessels make the loudest noise. May God bless his words in our hearts. Happy Sunday to you all. Let us pray. Almighty ever-living God, save us from falling into the trap of faithlessness. Teach us to accept rejection positively and help us always to stand by the truth. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. And may the blessings of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit come down and remain with you all, both now and forever. Amen.